Hi listener, this is From My Geology to Unity, a spiritual journey where we let go of ego and ideological doctrine in favour of meaning, purpose and unity as a whole. Today, I'm doing a reading from Quantum Theory and Free Will by Henry P. Stapp. This is part two, and I'm reading chapter two here, which is Waves, Particles and Minds. The publishing details will be in the description. So, classical mechanics developed during the 19th century, drew principally to the work of James Clerk Maxwell into a form that involved two kinds of physical stuff, particles and waves. Electrons are the prime example of particles, whereas light in the form of the electromagnetic field is the prime example of a wave. Particles are tiny, highly localized structures, each with a center that, at each instant of time, is situated at one precise point in three-dimensional space, with the rest of the particle lying nearby. A wave, on the other hand, tends to spread out over a large region in space and to exhibit interference patterns due to the cancellations or reinforcements of moving crests and troughs. Particles and waves have, therefore, contradictory structures. Particles always stay tiny, whereas waves tend to spread out. Thus Planck's discovery in 1900 that light, which had seemed to be a wave, had a corpuscular nature, came as quite a shock. Light of a given frequency appeared to be emitted in chunks, each carrying a quantity of energy that is directly proportional to that frequency of light wave, with a direct proportionality factor called Planck's constant. Albert Einstein won the Nobel Prize for his explanation five years later of the photoelectric effect. Empirically, a metallic surface radiated by light of a definite frequency emits electrons with energies equal after correction for energy needed to get the electron out of the metal to the energy of the incoming quantum of light, now understood to be localized like a particle. So there's a fundamental alignment between the particle and the wave, which means they're two sides of the same coin, essentially. But that sounds contradictory, right? So that's the whole issue they're grappling with. The concepts of classical physics were unable to cope with this wave-particle duality problem, or with a large number of other problems concerning the properties of atoms. A new way of understanding nature was needed and was created. Science and philosophy. These problems of wave particle duality and atomic structure appear to be completely physical in character. But the founders of quantum mechanics were men profound of profound philosophical bent. Niels Bohr's father was an eminent physiologist, familiar with the writings of William James, Wolfgang Pauli, and, and Wolfgang Pauli was the godson of the philosopher Ernst Macht. Werner Heisenberg, whose father was also a professor, was greatly influenced by the views of Bohr and Pauli. All these were strongly influenced by the view of Albert Einstein that science rests in the end on empirical findings. And that our physical theories are basically human interventions that help us deal with the world known to us only via our conscious observations and experiences. Bohr, concurring, announced at the start of his 1934 book, Atomic Theory and the Description of Nature, that in physics, our problem consists in the coordination of our experiences of the external world. A few pages later, page 18, he writes, in our description of nature, the purpose is not to disclose the real essence of phenomena, but only to track down as far as possible relations between the multifold aspects of our experience. You know, there's quite a humility in that. Um, and but in order to really appreciate that approach of his, you've kind of got to not be so attached to absolute objectivity and absolute objective measurement of reality, like absolute 
completely rational, completely impartial, just hard fact that's established and you can't doubt it. Like that is not really achievable. And yet we've got this idea in our society that we're dealing with facts of that nature. But even scientific facts as we know them aren't really like that. And there's a certain humility to recognizing that we're dealing with, we're dealing with different experiences and relations between them. In line with this viewpoint, the founders of quantum theory officially presented their theory not as what would normally be called a description of an existing and evolved material reality, as was done in classical mechanics. Their theory was offered rather as a tool that scientists have invented for making testable and usable predictions about future experiences on the basis of knowledge gleaned from prior experiences. I mean, that's just a humble way of putting the same thing, isn't it? I mean, it's still science, it's the same methodology. The official position wasn't a secure one from which Burr could defend the theory against Einstein's objections. You know, maybe though, maybe it was a, a position to take in light of the physicalist paradigm. Um, so that the, um, it's a bit like Jung. Right, Carl Jung had to frame, he had to, his theory, he couldn't just, if he just went all out with the Gnostic stuff, um, he would have been ridiculed. He wouldn't have been taken seriously and his, his ideas wouldn't have had the impact they did. Unfortunate that it is, it's true, um, because he, he couched those ideas or when he explored them, he he did it as an investigation of archetypes and so forth. Um, because of that, um, it wasn't, he was still, he's still not taking that seriously, to be honest, but he still was quite impactful into the into psychology. And with this, quantum physics perhaps didn't have the impact. It, it had less of an impact, but it had an impact as opposed to be throwing out like trash, right? Um, I had an idea and I have no way to back it up. It's conspiracy theory of sorts. The idea that Albert Einstein was basically given that knowledge and that he was sort of controlled way of bringing out the idea of time, space, being a continuum and so forth in such an idea that was still physicalist right such that quantum physics wouldn't have the impact potentially that it would because they had to hold back how they put it so that they didn't put forth the mysticism that they did strongly suspect at the very least um because well well, it says, doesn't it? From which Burr could defend the theory from against Einstein's objections. And Einstein was very influential at the time. Although, of course, it's not just it, Einstein. I guess the theory would be suggest that Einstein was working for the cabal, whether he wanted to or not. Uh, I don't know that. that that's just a random idea. Um, but maybe not. Maybe he just believed in the physicalism of the time. I mean, that is also, that also makes sense. And the idea that scientists are influenced by a deliberately influenced so that they won't stray into certain areas or away some certain, par a certain paradigm. I mean, I would say that that's, that, that, that does happen. Um, and there's a lot of information that it seems that the majority of the scientific community just doesn't know about, even though it would completely change what they do if they knew about it. 
and this is data that they're just kind of kept from having is kept from their circles i suppose you could say anyway um it was useful also for keeping students on a productive track of learning how to use the theory in practical applications and preventing them from spending wasting their time pondering philosophical issues about which even the founders did not fully agree Heisenberg and Pauli both devoted much time and effort trying to understand the nature of reality lying behind the pragmatic rules. And von Neumann speaks in his discussion of the measuring process about the connection of the intellectual inner life of the individual to the circumstances which already, which actually exist in nature. He, he seems very clearly to be talking about an, an underlying reality, not merely a pragmatic tool. The fate of classical mechanics provides a stark warning to the danger of taking initial successes as tantamount to victory in search of tr for truth. Accordingly, the impressive empirical successes of standard Copenhagen Orthodox quantum mechanics have failed to convince all physicists of the need to bring into dynamical laws any experiential quality that is not fully specified by the material and space-time structure of the universe. Alternatives to standard quantum mechanics have thus been proposed that are essentially in line with precepts of materialism, which exclude from the dynamics all immaterial elements. But the theme of this book is that von Neumann's orthodox formulation of quantum mechanics as elucidated herein by virtue of the rational coherence of its mathematical, empirical and philosophical components. The qualifications that warrant its being regarded as an adequate putative theory of reality itself. So it does fit the standards of science so just because it's not necessarily materialist in the classical sense, that's not something wrong with it. The realistically interpreted, interpreted orthodox quantum mechanics described here violates the demand of materialism that our conscious experiences have no causal power beyond what can be explained by the causal properties of matter alone. Where matter consists of things described in geometrical terms and built out of geometrical structures like Newtonian particles and their associated energy carrying fields. The quantum mechanical world is basically a psychophysical structure in which the causal effects of the disparate mental and atomic particle based elements are woven together by means of von Neumann's carefully formulated quantum dynamical laws. Those laws entail that a person's material actions can be influenced in specific ways by his or her mental aspects, in ways that are not fixed by evolving material aspects of the universe alone. This understanding of standard Copenhagen von Neumann quantum mechanics is thus fundamentally non-materialistic, fundamentally non-materialistic. Our mental aspects enter into the evolution of matter in ways that are not reducible to effects of matter alone. It is an understanding that is based on the words and concepts of the founders, particularly Heisenberg's and Bohr's reference to the free choices of probing actions on the part of the experimenter observers, of the experimenter observers and direct choice of response on the part of nature. All rigorous rigorously expressed in the mathematics and words of John von Neumann. This insertion of fundamentally mental causes into our basic physical theory generates a gross violation of what had for 200 years been widely regarded as a key feature of a scientific theory of reality. Although keep in mind, this has been 100 years in which it's been around and the full impact hasn't really been felt of quantum physics. This non-materialistic these ramifications and it must be deliberate it's a threat to 
the the physicalist narrative that's being pushed by the Illuminati. So, <clears throat> as a key feature of a scientific theory of reality, a feature considered to identify a proposed theory as science, as opposed to non-science. Indeed, the materialist demand of strict exclusion from the material world of all as effects of mental causes is still regarded as a scientific imperative by many researchers who consequently endeavor to explain the seemingly mind-related behavior of a person's body while stoutly denying the possibilities of any causal the possibility of any actual causal effect that the person's mind of that person's mind upon his or her bodily behavior. But how did this radical break with materialism ever come about? How and why did the band of highly reputable physicists that created quantum mechanics suddenly in 1925 feel entitled to make this huge break with the then highly honored classical materialistic tradition? The answer is to be found in Heisenberg's seminal 1925 discovery. The common idea of quantum mechanics in the minds of many non-physicists centers on Bohr's renowned model of the atom. According to that model, atoms are like miniature classical solar systems in which the circling electrons tend to stay on favored orbits, but make occasional jumps from one such orbit to another with an associated emission or absorption of a photon. I would keep in mind the similarity with solar systems here. I mean, they're, they're pretty explicit with it. And that's the correspondence principle, uh, the law of correspondence in uh, hermetics, I would say. As above, so below. That model is essentially a classical physical system with some added quantum conditions that there exists some favored orbits whose locations are related to the mysterious quantum constant discovered in 1900 by Max Planck. Bohr's model dates from 1913 and hence was 12 years shy of the 1925 creation of quantum mechanics. While that 1913 model certainly does bring an important quantum element into the dynamics, it is seriously deficient as a characterization of the essential difference between quantum mechanics and its quantum, between classical mechanics and its quantum successor. It is ironic that this Bohr model of orbiting electrons is often offered as an example of the quantum, na quantum nature of things, when actually the creation of quantum mechanics triggered by Heisenberg's 1925 work was precisely a rejection of the idea of the 1913 classical quasi-classical Bohr model with its definite trajectories of orbiting electrons and lack of all reference to our knowledge. And I would suggest that that's deliberate. I guess who? The Illuminati. <laughs> uh, you might be, you know, just a trend there, but yeah. The key differences between, this, between standard Copenhagen orthodox quantum mechanics and its classical predecessor are, first, that the classical notion of particles as tiny objects moving on trajectories is replaced by the quantum notion of atomic particles represented by waves. Second, that in the new theory, these particles do not have well-defined trajectories. And third, that the needed abrupt collapses of the quantum states of systems are instigated by mental aspects of nature, not by purely mechanical material aspect of nature acting alone. Thus our conscious experiences are, according to the new orthodox view, not causally inert bystanders, as in classical mechanics, but play an essential causal role in the determination of the objective psychophysical future. These, few, these differences underscore the radical, radically new ideas that emerged from Heisenberg's 1925 discovery, and that are mathematically embodied in realistically construed standard, pardon me, Copenhagen Orthodox RQFT quantum mechanics. The principle of the causal closer of nature is, as mentioned earlier, 
sometimes regarded as part of a definition of science, a discriminating property that sets science apart from non-science. But science is perhaps better characterized following the leads of Galileo and Bacon by our essential use of probing actions intended to test hypotheses and thereby allowing us to acquire knowledge about the material world, coupled with our practical applications of the knowledge that we thereby acquire. The reason is associated with the causal closure of the physical, that is physical causation and taking out the mental or the uh, spiritual or anything like that. Um, it's because when classical theory like Newton's was being done, they would they were only really observing physical effects and physical causes at that point, at that level of analysis. And it was convenient in certain respects at this time of enlightenment for it increasingly to be secular explanations that did not involve God at all or anything at the time. And this is um, not actually what science is about. It may have been a pattern at the time in what was observed and what was the evidence was coming up with at the time, but it wasn't the full picture as we know with quantum mechanics, which shows a broader picture. And that's not even what science is about. We know that science is a methodology. It's not physicalism, right? It's not an ideology of physicalism and a methodology to suit that. It's the other way around. It's the methodology comes first. You know, I've been making, there's a mistake I've been making actually recently. And it's this idea where you come across people saying, okay, you haven't got evidence. And you've done research, you know how it fits together, but at the top of your head, you don't really have like a reference to actual data or evidence right at hand. So I don't know, maybe it's just me. You might get like tired of the idea of that. So you might just be like, no, I don't need evidence. That's bullshit. <laughs> Fuck that whole methodology. Um, but there's actually no need because the methodology proves mysticism. Um, and the fact is, you know, I do acknowledge that. I acknowledge that science is a very effective method um the problem is that there's the paradigm is so well it's an ideological paradigm really and it's so rigid that and it seems to be so much conditioned to society that whether it's a scientist or an individual who isn't a scientist, you know, who comes across it, that the what breaks from that, even if it's like mainstream quantum physics, or at least taking it as a description of reality, you know, what you tend to do with scientific theories. Um, it's just mystical bunk, right? But if it's based on the science, the actual evidence and the scientific process, then you can't really say that. And it just seems like the, the evidence is just being ignored in an unscientific way. And that those who actually do the evidence in a rigorous way, you know, some of those people you get in like Gaia.com, um, they're ridicule, but they're actually more thoroughly following the scientific process. It's backwards. Things that flipped on the head by the cabal is a regular thing. We're told that, you know, it, it's more it's not that kooky traditionalism where you blindly believe things. It's based on evidence and rationality. And yet we're being expected to blindly believe in what they're telling us is the truth rather than questioning at ourselves. Now, science 
And the whole paradigm of science claims this is about people questioning reality and understanding reality as it actually works instead of just believing what they're told. That's the whole idea that they push. And yet the way the interaction is between people and what the truth we're being told is and how we're meant to relate to that is fundamentally the same interaction between the clergy and the, the public as a whole back in medieval times right if it was truly following the principles of that the enlightenment claims as its own which would be seeking to understand reality as it is seeking truth for its own sake this mysticism stuff and anything whether it's in biology and other areas that doesn't align with the physicalist narrative being pushed under the cover and pushed away like oh no no that's not legitimate like that in an unscientific way like that it's backwards it's completely backwards and they're going to be double standard and the only reason it goes along with it is because people believe in it and or told to believe in it, a condition to believe in it and just go along with it because they're told to by authority figures the exact problem with happened with the catholic church and religious organized religion in the past. So we haven't really improved in our society. We might as well be in medieval Europe in a sense. It's just that the actual doctrine, the religious doctrine has changed. Now the religion is a physicalist religion. Or you could say, you could say, I mean, even Satanism, like, like the official thing of like, there is actually people like we're saying this we believe this this and this it's very secular very secular and it seems to be honestly if you think about it that the prevailing idea that i don't even believe i don't think satan makes sense as like in terms of the the bible as like a an actual figure even in the bible lucifer actually has some reality in the bible i guess you could say if you look at it in that lens but like Lucifer's just like um Satan just like means in the Bible like the great opposition or something else so opposition and it's used in different contexts like it's a different being in it's just like it's not a distinct being it's just like opposition it's translations are used in very strategic ways uh, uh with religious texts anyway anyway um I'll go back to the physics Bohr's 1913 model does not bring into the dynamics any clear indication of the failure of the core precepts of materialistic classical physics. It merely adds some quantum conditions. So it's just a way of, you could say, the way the elites are focusing entirely on that and not on the bolder aspect of what Heisenberg discovered is that it's a, how do you put it? It's like a parachute, like, they're falling and they're like, okay, this is a problem. We don't have this discovery, right? So we just control it, right? You can say it's like control or position or something. It's like a, let's control the fall so it suits our interest rather than letting the, this discovery actually shake our foundations here of our control. So it merely adds some quantum conditions. And that model seemed to be putting quantum, that model seemed to be putting physics onto a promising track. But then how and why did this radical triad of ideas, the representation of an atomic particle by a wave, the emission of a part of particle trajectories, and the essential incorporation into the dynamics of the non-materialistic process of acquiring knowledge suddenly became accepted in 19... 25 by the founders of quantum mechanics as core precepts of their new physical theory. How did those completely alien and subversive ideas gain traction in a scientific environment so intrinsically hostile to it? This abrupt 1925 turnaround, turnabout was instigated by the persisting failures of the semi-classical attempts to account for the accumulating data of atomic physics coupled with the profound discovery made in 1925 by Weiner Heisenberg. 
he had come to believe that something was profoundly wrong with the essentially classical ideas of the 1913 Boer model, and that the needed new theory should be built on properties that are actually known to exist. By virtue of our capacity to become cognizant of their numerical values, numerical values by performing appropriate measuring procedures. These considerations directed Heisenberg's attention to the empirical processes of acquiring knowledge. While studying theoretically the process of the processes of measuring respectively the location and the momentum of an atomic particle, say an electron, Heisenberg found that if the location was measured first and the momentum second, then the product of the two outcomes differs from the product obtained when the two properties are measured in reverse order. And the difference between these two products is essentially the famous constant that Planck discovered in 1900. Consequently, this completely unexpected connection between the outcomes of two observation procedures must be connected to the quantum character of reality. And it entails that the process of requiring knowledge about the material properties cannot generally leave those properties undisturbed. For if the process of acquiring knowledge allowed the observer simply to become aware of fixed pre-existing values, then the two products of the outcomes could not remain differing by the fixed Planck constant in the limit in which the times of the two measurements tend to become equal. Heisenberg discovers that our actions of acquiring knowledge must disturb the observed system in detailed ways that are intric intricately tied to the, Planck con the Planck's constant. The discovery quickly led Heisenberg, Born, and Jordan to a radical, radically new theory based on the idea that in keeping with certain prevailing philosophical ideas, the core subject matter of a prevailing, of a sub, pardon me, the core subject matter of a satisfactory theory of the, of the nature of things should be the evolving structure of our empirical knowledge of the world, not the evolving structure of an imagined material world built primarily upon Newton's solid, massy, hard, impenetrable, movable particles. I mean, I mean, just the scientific method, right? Not physicalism. Those particles can reasonably be viewed as pure fictions that happen to be useful in certain macroscopic contexts, but that fail to work in situations involving our acquiring of knowledge about the structure and behavior of atomic particles, particularly those contained in the neural brain correlates of our perceptions. The notion that the material world is built principally out of these Newtonian particles from the standard view of quantum mechanics is use, a useful fictional creation of Isaac Newton. There exists no empirical evidence for their actual existence. Accordingly, the core subject matter of the new theory is taken to be something we do know, namely the structure of our evolving knowledge of the material world. No, knowledge of the material world. This knowledge is asserted to be generated by the specified objective mind-brain process of acquiring subjective knowledge. This process of observation is, according to the new theory, instigated in part, just as we innately feel it is, by the observer's mental intent and conscious effort, which thereby causally affect the observed material world. Orthodox QM spells out in great, although not complete, detail of how this mind-brain connection works. Using measuring devices to acquire knowledge about the matter dates from antiquity, and telescopes and microscopes were important in the development of classical mechanics. But in quantum mechanics, Heisenberg's discovery entails that in principle, these two processes of measurement of location and momentum cannot individually always leave the measured system just as it was. And with definite, and with definite values of these two properties, for if they did, then the product of the outcomes of these two knowledge acquiring operations would have to be independent of the temporal ordering of these two procedures in the limit in which they became simultaneous. Thus Heisenberg's 1925 discovery entails that the increases 
in our knowledge of the properties of matter, which we acquire by performing measurements, cannot in general leave the state of the measured matter unchanged. And with the definite values of these two properties, the probing process that allows us to gain knowledge about the properties of matter must, in principle, sometimes disturb these properties by finite non-zero amounts specified by Planck's constant. But in classical mechanics, this difference can in principle be smaller than what quantum reality demands. Thus, in order to accommodate Heisenberg's finding about the mind-brain connection, we must, as a matter of principle, abandon classical mechanics, and more generally, the philosophy of materialism. Now, I mean, this is quantum physics, so I do encourage you, if you're not quite sure on certain details, obviously, you can go back, All right? I mean, you know that anyway, but yeah. <clears throat> I do like, you know what I like about, I really like how relatable this is for the layman. It, it explains these complex concepts, but in a way, in a way that's understandable if you don't know all their terminology necessarily. The problem facing the founders was not merely to acknowledge the failure of the simple idea that we trivially acquire knowledge of the material world by simply mentally grasping directly the material facts as was effectively assumed in classical mechanics. It is obvious that the fact that we can learn about the motions of tiny pinpoints of light that correspond to planets without appreciably affecting their motions does not automatically carry over to the motions of the points that correspond to the locations of the electrons or at atoms in our brains. The needed quantum theory had to account for the fact that the process of acquiring knowledge about the properties of the material world had to disturb the material structure in precisely the quantitative way needed to account for Heisenberg's findings. Thus, a major revision of our understanding of the mind-matter connection lies at the heart of quantum mechanics. And that's why we can't just, we can't just do the half-assed um, compromise of taking Neil Boyle's position of a largely orthodox perception of things, orthodox understanding of the atom with just a few quantum modifications. To expect under these conditions to understand the mind-brain connection within the materialistic classical framework is truly an, an astonishing hypothesis, as was recognized by Francis Crick, who nevertheless espoused it and called for a classical phys physics-based neuroscience. That recommendation has dominated subsequent neuroscience and produced a plethora of data, but unsubscribingly, no understanding of how our, our mental consciousness is connected to our brain, or to our material brains. This book is about the non-astonishing quantum. Um, this book is about the non-astonishing orthodox quantum mechanics claim that the mind-matter connection is a quantum effect. It's interesting. So they do a bunch of scientific measurements under on the brain under materialist presumptions, essentially, or materialist um, paradigm. And they've gathered a whole load of data. You know, they've studied the brain with different scans and they've looked at the patterns. Oh, and they've seen data for sure, but what did they actually manage to explain with that? Well, maybe a few things, but largely the actual connection between neurology and psychology, for example, is, is highly tenuous, highly tenuous. Um, it's largely, that gap is still huge. The gap between the physical and the mental hasn't been bridged. They haven't managed to explain it in physical ways yet. Yeah. They just haven't. Because the paradigm isn't working. Maybe the paradigm could make sense of all that data. The same way 
that the that, that the uh, Neoplatonic epicycles that were going that seemed that the the planets and even the sun was going around in these little wavy epicycle lines that made no sense around the earth like made complete much more, more sense if you took the copernican model of everything going around the sun right just that one change of paradigm and all the data suddenly explains a lot more right In the light of Heisenberg's discovery, the founders of quantum mechanics were emboldened to let go of classical mechanics, which effectively sets Planck's constant to zero in conflict with nature, and instead build a rationally coherent alternative to classical mechanics that incorporates into its foundational structure Heisenberg's discovery, pertaining to the general non-trivial effects of the process of acquiring subjective knowledge about the objective state of the material world and that moreover permits precise predictions about what the observed structure of about the preserved stru observed structure of human knowledge and it's interesting that so there's this really key part of theory in physics the Planck constant and they're like let's just treat it like it has no impact just so we can maintain physicalism I mean that's an astonishing hypothesis I mean, that's an understatement. I mean, that's stereotypically British. I don't know if Francis Crick was English, but it wouldn't, that wouldn't surprise me. But that's a generalization, isn't it? Right. Within this quantum framework, a person's acquired knowledge of material properties is not a faithful representation of the pre-probing properties of the observed system, i.e., well, yeah, it's a certain way, you observe it, it's not that way anymore. But is instead an output of a dynamical probing processes, an output of dynamical probing processes initiated by the observing person. The observer's uncoerced mat by matter choices of what to observe affect the temporal evolution of the material aspects of nature. So mentalism, that we affect reality with our minds. A semantic law. Science is basically going to prove all the hermetic laws right, isn't it? And then it'll see, then we'll find out that. Hermes Trimiscestas and um, Thoth, the Atlantean, you know, these ideas, the, the ideas of hermetics that go back to the ancient Greeks, right? No, the ancient Egyptians. These ideas, like, you could say they're ahead of the time, but not really. It's more like we kind of went backwards. So we're behind our time, in a sense. One therefore cannot exclude the effects of the processes of our acquiring knowledge from an adequate basic physical theory. But that effect is both limiting and liberating. It limits by the uncertainty principle what we can know, but expands by the entailed power of our minds the possibilities for what we can do. So our freedom, in a sense, in a loose sense, in a loose sense, our freedom is greatly enhanced by this, it entails that we have a great deal of freedom over experience of reality, um, unless that is we allow us it. If the freedom is contingent upon not limiting yourself and your own perceptions, since your own perceptions, your own mental aspect of your reality fundamentally affects your reality. 
And at the same time, there's a fundamental humility to it, a recognition of we don't know everything. I, I, I don't know this, I don't know that, right? And what does that humility and that recognition of I don't know give you? Well, in meditative, in meditation and spirituality, the benefit of I don't know, you could say to the extreme, the idea is I don't know anything or I don't. And it's there's a, it distracts from ego, right? Because the ego wants to know everything and have control, right? And maybe that's why it's a threat to the establishment in the sense of that sense of ultimate freedom through creating a reality from your mind. They don't want people to know about that because they want to manipulate people's own mental creations. If you can manipulate people and their power of creation of reality, then you indirectly can wield control over the nature of reality, essentially, or the reality on earth, right? Mind control is physical control. I mean, if you look at Edward Bernays and what he did with, with uh, Freud's insights, and it was like, okay, let's just use it to in advertising to manipulate people and stuff to get make money. I mean, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, what the CIA have been doing and all sorts of things. Like, there's a lot of manipulation going on, right? And this manipulation, this perhaps mind control. If you look at how the mind affects reality, if you control how people's minds, you control how they affect reality, thus you indirectly can control reality, physical reality. That's quite concerning, isn't it? So, yeah. The orthodox quantum framework is therefore not an arbitrary construct conjured up out of thin air by its founders, but and justified merely by its eventual success in accounting for the behavior of matter. The driving endeavor of the founders was to create a rationally coherent conceptual structure that accommodates and explains and is able to make useful predictions about the structure of our conscious experiences. Our experiences thereby become the basic veridical, veridic, veridical Veridical, wait, I said it right the first time, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, veridical realities of the reality, not misleading, not misleading delusions. But of course, maybe that's part of the manipulation. The, the idea that it's like a gaslighting, isn't it? So I, mean, I get us to think that it's all delusion, but our mental effect of reality isn't a delusion. The delusion is the negation of that the delusion fostered deliberately by the elites. Heisenberg's 1925 discovery was that the process of acquiring knowledge about the material world is very non-trivial. It is not a mere grasping of pre-existing realities, but a highly structured action upon those realities that the unexpected result elevates the scientific based conception of ourselves from passive observers to active agents. That reversal is the underlying core message of quantum mechanics. In off-sighted words of Niels Bohr, in the drama of existence, we are ourselves both actors and spectators. Sound mystical yet? Standard quantum theory is thus a psychophysical or perhaps an epistomaterial theory of the interaction of the evolving material aspects of nature with our evolving knowledge of those aspects. The theory, with its detailed agreements with observed, hence macroscopic data, emerged basically from Heisenberg's guiding, prin guiding principle, which restricts what the theory postulates to exist to properties of a kind that we can, via our observations, know to exist, or no exist. His principle was to build on an empirically secure foundation instead of an empirically unsupported guesses instead of empirically unsupported guesses. 
i.e. materialistic science, even Newtonian science, which is, by the way, kind of unscientific, unlike quantum physics, unlike taking quantum physics, the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, as a description of reality and thus taking it as scientific proof of mysticism. That's scientific, denying it unscientific. So like, oh, I remember the meme, isn't it? Like, um, was it? I can't remember it. It's like, take that atheist. No, it's not that, uh, <laughs> whatever. <clears throat> so, The close agreement of the resulting theory with normal objective empirical data is certainly a bottom line success. But standard quantum theory describes via process one, also the dynamical connection between a person's mentally instigated actions and that person's consequent, consequent mental perceptions of the material responses to those actions. All right, so in case this is, you're, you're watching from episode two without watching episode one, or in case, um, you can't quite recall what process one is. So in the last chapter, I was talking about process one and process two. These are something, uh, this is actually something discovered in quantum physics where there's one process that is detected, which is process one, which is founded in the, um, Born rule. It relates to the Born rule, where essentially what is here? process one is the process that generates perceptions. Each process one action is associated with a particular conscious observer. It is a mathematical form that is very different from that of process two. Process one is not unitary, but is instead projective. It associates with the subjective occurrence of a perception coupled with the instantaneous elimination from the material universe of all aspects that are incompatible with the occurrence of that perception. This, by the way, is a collapse of the superposition so in terms of Skoda's cat, it's the idea of, uh, so the cat is both alive and dead before you, essentially, or both, both realities exist independently yet simultaneously. Uh, and the box is opened and you either find a dead cat or an alive cat. And that your mental perception of what you expect may well actually affect which one you find. If you're actually, if your mental state is more predisposing things to be, if you expect there to be a live cat, you might get a live cat, unless you're terribly, terribly afraid of the cat being dead. Oh, we're hoping it's alive. That might mean it's dead. Okay, this is like stretching it a bit far, but you see the point um, that there's basically a mental aspect that affects reality. Um, the the observation and the mental aspect of the observation affecting the result. Whereas process two is simply based on the Schrodinger equation, like this is like a it playing out in a certain certain reality, right? And it just happens it will play out in the one that's chosen by process one. And uh, it's like a program. Process one is the programmer or the um, the user of a program or software. And process two is the software operating according to its programming, right? So there's a game, right? And you decide which way you go up, left, right, up, down, left, right, okay? It's a very basic game. And process one is the pressing of the buttons right? Process two is the actual programming software doing its thing based on the programming. Okay, so in that context, in that context, 
But where are we? Where are we? But standard quantum theory describes via process one also the dynamical connection between a person's mentally instigated actions and that person's consequent mental perceptions of material responses to those actions, as in effectively based on mental state, you get a certain one of the possibilities playing out in physical reality, the others just don't play out in reality anymore. Any putative alternative non-standard quantum theory that fails to provide a rational theory of the, these more subjective aspects of the mind-brain connection is fundamentally deficient compared to the standard quantum mechanics. Now, I'm sure there are interpretations of quantum physics that aren't materialistic, but there are a lot that aren't. Even Bohmian mechanics, this idea that Oh, no, I won't get into that now. It's probably going to, they're probably going to go into that later. Um, but even with Bowman mechanics, they actually discovered the non-locality. Um, despite the idea that it's meant to be hidden variables that underlie it in an objective way, they kind of discovered that everything is non-locally connected in a universal sense. So, well, that didn't really work out well for them, did it? It was the assumed possibility for an ideal observer to know in principle simultaneously both the location and the momentum of every particle in the universe. And eventually the analogous properties of the fields that allowed Laplace to deduce from the materialist principles of classical mechanics, the determinism of the material world. And hence within the framework of classical mechanics, the impossibility of a causal intervention of anything not fully characterized by its material properties. Wait. Ah, okay. So he deduced it from material principles of quantum mechanics. Okay. I'll read that again for my own sake, partly. It was the assumed possibility for an ideal observer to know in principle simultaneously, keep in mind, in principle, this is hypothetical, in principle, simultaneously, both the location and the momentum of every particle in the universe, from a God perspective, by the way, this is ironic considering it was a secular perspective framed using a hypothetical God perspective. Um, and eventually the analogous properties of the fields that allowed Laplace to something entirely hypothetical and involving a reference to God by someone who doesn't believe in it, that allowed Laplace to deduce from the materialist principles of classical mechanics, the de determinism of the material world. And hence within the framework of, of classical mechanics, which by the way, is like 19th century stuff, We've moved on from the impossibility of a causal intervention of anything not fully characterized by its material properties. But that, but that notion, that whole notion of the causal closure of the physical fails in a world where the mind dependent quantum dynamical rules prevail. Also, it's not scientific, it's entirely deduced. We do not directly perceive atomic particles. We perceive only big macroscopic systems that are built out of combinations of large numbers of atomic particles and their associated physical fields. Quantum mechanics has well-defined rules for combining many atomic particles together to make big object, objects and systems and to represent the mathem in mathematical language, the purely mechanical process too, aspect of the evolution of those macroscopic systems. And I would say that one thing called the quantum mechanics taken as an actual representation of reality rather than a practical set of rules is it actually connects up the micro and the macro. A quote, big physical object, although perceived in classical describable terms, is not causally governed by the laws of classical physics. It must be treated as a conglomeration of its atomic quantum constituents in order to account for its physical properties, such as rigidity and electrical conductivity. Yet, 
if it is treated as a conglomeration of its atomic quantum mechanical constituents evolving in accordance with process two alone, then it will not have in general, the, and most specifically when it is a measuring device, a classically described location and shape. Process two generates a quantum state, i.e. density matrix, that represents a sum called a mixture of a continuum of possible or potential possible worlds of the type that we can actually perceive or experience, but does not specify which element or set of elements in this continuum, continuum will be actualized if someone looks. So even if you just go with process two in a materialist way, you have fundamentally mystical implications. <laughs> um, so they can't really win in that respect because if they do that, there's so much uncertainty about location and position anyway. So you can't really evolve the mysticism of this, not honestly anyway. This mixture of potentialities is sometimes called a smear of potentialities. Thus the quantum mechanical state of mac the macroscopical pointer on the measuring device is by virtue of the process to evolution smeared out over a continuous collection of potential locations along a dial. It's almost like hypothetical timeline, like different timelines, right? Spread out along a spectrum of possibilities. And things being in spectrums, quantum law of one is very common because binary polar opposites of one or the other aren't really, these dualities are an illusion and ultimately it's all integrated, united into one scale with these things. So it's not, for example, hot or cold, it's hot, cold scale, the heat scale, essentially. That's just one example. But that whole smear is not what is perceived if someone looks. It is the mind independent process one, not the mind. It is the mind dependent process one, not the mind independent process two, that resolves the question of what our actual experiences are. I mean, that's key, right? Law of attraction, much? Mentalism, much? Process two, evolution includes the interaction of the system of interest with its surrounding environment. But that environmental decoherence effect falls far short of specifying what an observer will experience perceive if he looks. It is process one, not mere environmental decoherence that provides that needed result. As already described in chapter one, this process one first selects from a process two generated continuum of potentialities a particular perception that might occur. The nature chooses the nature, so conscious life, so source, so souls, so we do, God at the same time, chooses, subject to the statistical born rule, either to accept the possibility selected by the observer and then actualize the global consequences of that acceptance or actualize the global consequences of rejecting the observer's proposal. And that distinction between accepting and rejecting also seems, sounds like service to others versus service to self, interestingly because acceptance is key to accessing love. The above description decomposes the standard VN description of an event that can involve at all, all at once a large set of possibilities into an ordered sequence of possibilities, each involving a single yes, no question as in the game of 20 questions. Thus the whole large set of questions Thus, the, the whole large set questions can be considered to be posed one by one with no passage of physical time until a yes response eventually appears, all within a moment. This whole set of questions asked all at the same time, and then based on the whole set of things, it plays out. The program plays out based on the programming, and programming happens in the moment.
This easily graspable formation proposed by Wheeler is equivalent to the standard one and the more and more easily converted to, into the relativistic version demanded by RQFT. That, that, that latter version of the theory requires a particular 3D global instinct, global instant now be defined in association with each of nature's yes, no responses and that the associated global collapse be instituted along the, that 3D surface, which divides 4D space time into an associated past and associated future, which will be discussed later. Interestingly, that suggests that the past and future and the whole time laid out in continuous series of events is created from in the moment a set of yes no questions being answered by well it's described as by nature and also by actors it understood in the law of one sense that would be source which is all souls and god um collaboratively in a as a unified sense as part of an overall unified field co-creating reality by answering questions yes no questions differently let's say though that might not be so simple as that because yes no is a binary duality and everything is part of a scale and unified but by answering a set of questions about reality that essentially program reality in the moment which is eternal by the way and determine what happens in time. The illusion, the holographic reality that plays out in process two. Process two, holographic reality. Process one, divine creation. By means of the two processes, process one and two, the standard Copenhagen von Neumann approach elevates our inner mental selves, our egos, from passive spec from passive spectators to as of a wow <laughs> sorry i'll say that again elevates okay elevates our inner mental selves our egos from passive spectators to active agents from this orthodox quantum mechanical perspective the basic difficulty with putative materialistic versions of quantum mechanics that leave our human mental choices out of the dynamics is that they leave the theory burdened with one, our useless conscious processes, and two, a quantum mechanically evolving world with no means for selecting from the process two generated quantum smears of possibilities what our actual perceptions will be. Now some, uh, I think Feynman did this, it, 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 treat it as entirely random. But that relies on a set of cosmic dice determining things. And Einstein, even Einstein, recognized the problem with that. Um, like, there's no explanation of why, of how there's this random determination of what happens and which of those random things occurs and why. It's just like, oh, right, cosmic die. Yeah, this random thing happened. What even is random? Like, even when we try to simulate random in computing, for example, all you can really get is an algorithm that's like a, like a, a rational number, like a pi or something. It's not pi, but whatever. And like, there's a process by which it's one of the numbers is selected. And it's effectively random, but not really. It's an illusion of random. It's just that it's random from our perspective or at least very unpredictable. It relies on chaos theory and chaos unpredictability, not on actual randomness. So, yeah, it's kind of weak. Moreover, the denial of the causal potency of our mental efforts is blatantly contradicted empirically by the ubiquitous experiences of everyday life. The materialists claim that this experiential basis of our lives is an illusion rings hollow when the theory makes this claim that makes this claim is found to be false and is replaced by a hugely successful theory in which the ubiquitous daily experiences of the causal power of our mental intentions in the world of matter is rationally explained. Also considered that what does holographic theory tell us? What does 
Lord one tell us and these things? What does mysticism tell us? That the physical world is an illusion and the mental aspect of reality is the real one, essentially. Mentalism. So the physicalist understanding of reality is a reversion, is an inversion of reality. They flip it on its head. The, the cabal do this a lot. And what is a denial of reality, not accepting reality? Well, what you get is you don't get love. You just get fear, fear, anger, fear, anger, sadness, shame, guilt, those low emotions, right? To access those higher frequencies, you need acceptance of reality. If they're indoctrinating people to not accept actual reality, it's like they're indoctrinating people to try to get, they're indoctrinating people to lower the frequencies, to keep the frequencies low, to keep people in a controllable state of fear, anger, sadness, and so forth, of guilt especially, right? The standard Copenhagen von Neumann approach. Okay, how? Oh, yeah, we're close, we're close. Right. The standard Copenhagen von Neumann approach. The, the aforementioned smearing difficulty is resolved in the standard quantum approach by bringing into the dynamics something beyond the Schrodinger equation, namely the probing actions of observing agents. The probing query might be, will my upcoming experience be that of the pointer on the measuring device lying between 5 and 5.01 on the dial? A yes response on the part of nature consists of nature's delivering to the observer the query-defined possible experience and reducing the quantum state of the entire universe to the part of its prior self compatible with that yes response. A no answer result in a corresponding reduction but no immediate experiential feedback. This omission leaves room for another query to be posed with no passage of physical time. Thus millions of no's can be produced by nature with little or no passage of measured physical time. I mean, this idea of timing and illusion is uh, illuminated here. The primary, the primary reality assumption in the realistically interpreted orthodox quantum field theory that I'm describing is that the evolving quantum state, i.e. density matrix, of the universe is an element of reality. The behavior of this quantum state is concordant with the idea that it represents, as Heisenberg and the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead have emphasized, a collection of Aristotelian, in brackets that is, potentialities for future experiences. This quantum potentiality normally evolves according to the definite process too, but in order to become an actuality, a, a potentiality must be actualized by some other process, and the future is thus considered to be open, as in there's a superposition of possibilities. Then there has to be a collapse of those superpositions into one outcome. Right. In contrast, a future classical possibility is mechanically predetermined to happen or not happen already at the birth of the universe, thereby precluding any possibility that our mental intentions and efforts can make any difference in what happens to our physical bodies. In von Neumann's formulation, the purely atomic physics-based dynamical process, process two, does not fail because a system is big. It fails because the atom-based aspects of the dynamics are only part of a, the causal story. The causal deterministic unitary process two is, is disrupted by a non, by non-unitary process one, perceptual observations, which therefore have the causal effects upon the physical material world that are not caused by the purely matter-based process too. Thus, materialism fails. That is, the purely matter-based process two evolution fails when that evolution comes into causal contact with the material correlates of our subjective experiences, which are neural or brain correlates of our subjective experiences of probing and perceiving no other failure of process two 
is mentioned. Now, keep in mind, if you listen to episode one, that is, that the thing, the brain and the synapses have a fundamentally designed, you could say binary system of yes, no. It's like it's designed so that there's a set of possible questions that can be asked by the, in the brain, essentially, by the wiring of the brain, and the synapse will either make a connection or not. And based on that, um, well, the brain wire, based on that system is built into this quantum, so this quantum determination process of system process one and process two, it's built into the brain. So the brain is fundamentally evolved, let's say, and uh, the way it fundamentally is formed is in such a way entirely aligned with the creation of reality through process one and two, or primarily process one. Process two is just the playing out of that. And it's in the brain too, it's in the brain too. Von Neumann spends a lot of time and effort reducing the quantum mechanics to properties of so-called projection, of so-called projection operators. These can be directly related to experiments that have just two alternative possible results, yes or no, which can be associated with whether or not an observer perceives a specified response or fails to perceive such a response to his probing action. This association allows well-defined connections to be formed between von Neumann's mathematics and observer perceptions. If the answer is yes, then the specified perception occurs. If the answer is no, then no perception occurs. For no perception can at all, for no perception can be all the perceived perceptions other than the specified one. This rule allows many immediate no responses to be delivered by nature before the one yes in a multiple choice question. The purely mechanical atom-based process two evolution fails when a measuring process of is performed due to the overriding character of the process one action. Orthodox quantum mechanics is thus basically a description of this causal dynamical interaction between our conscious minds, which carry our perceptions and our material atom-based brains which contain the brain correlates of our probing actions and the responding perceptions. The earlier classical mechanics is constitutionally unable to accommodate the 20th century empirical data. The earlier classical mechanics is constitutionally unable to accommodate the 20th century empirical data. But the most elemental and ubiquitous source of empirical data, nature an ubiquitous source of empirical data is our own daily experiencing of the ability of one's mental effort to influence one's bodily action. Who has not win witnessed the intense struggle of the newborn infant to learn by trial and er error which mental effort produces which perceived bodily response? To classify this first-hand empirical data as an illusion in order to salvage a theory that is known to be fundamentally false and false in a way that is essentially an incorrect understanding of the connection between our conscious experiences and their brain counterparts is neither rational nor scientific. The quantum resuscitation of the causal power of our thoughts overturns the absurd classical notion that nature has endowed us with conscious minds whose only power and function is to delude us into believing that it is helping to create a future that advances our felt values while in actuality, that future was predetermined 15 billion years ago. Realistically interpreted, orthodox quantum theory thus provides us with a non-materialistic, science-based understanding of our intrinsic nature. It is a theory that accounts with spectacular accuracy for the structure of the empirical facts about the external world, discovered by atomic physicists, physicists during the 20th century. Many competent physicists struggle unsuccessfully for a quarter of a century 
struggled unsuccessfully for a quarter of a century to comprehend those facts in every imaginable way concordant with the materialistic worldview until Heisenberg. In 1925, lifting that restriction, but cling to the principle that the new theory should be built upon observables and hence in some way upon us observers broke the logjam in such a decisive way that poorly born Jordan and others immediately jumped on board. Einstein in 28 nominated he Einstein already in 1928 nominated Heisenberg, Born and Jordan for the Nobel Prize, which was awarded to Heisenberg in 1932. The stranglehold of materialism was broken simply by the need to accommodate the empirical data of atomic physics, but the ontological ramifications went far deeper into the issue of our own human nature and the power of our own thoughts to influence our psychophysical future. And that is chapter two. So that's powerful. I mean, that's very powerful. So, and I'm really enjoying reading this. So, what do I want to say about this? I mean, it speaks for itself and large, largely, doesn't it? Or rather, Henry Stapp speaks for himself, doesn't he? And it's elegant and simple in what it's doing. It's not some, it's not really that complicated. It's not a rationalization. It's not. It doesn't complicate things. It simplifies things in an elegant way because it says all this theory that exists already, it is a description of reality rather than just a pragmatic set of rules. And it's fitting because generally scientific theories are taken to be descriptions of reality. All it's doing is treating quantum theory or treating quantum mechanics like any other scientific theory is treated rather than treating it as special in some sense that we don't treat it as a description of reality for some reason. I mean, it's just simply you follow the scientific process and then you use the, the results as a description of reality, right? I mean, fundamentally, there's a way we don't need to view anymore as science as this physicalist thing and spirituality as this non-physicalist thing. And it goes back to Descartes or even earlier to Aquinas actually, this division here, but everything's unified, right? And if we're in the age of Aquarius, which is where things are, which do the unity, like, it's about time for us to view things as like, okay, why do we need to separate spirituality and science, especially when the actual evidence is pointing in that way? And this isn't some roundabout way of cherry picking things to try to be like, look, oh, look, see, see, spiritualism does have evidence. That this is like not doing the roundabout process of denying the evidence that it, of mysticism. It's the opposite. The way spiritualism is portrayed, this is simply following the scientific method. That's simply what it is. I mean, you're really going to consider how backwards things are represented by the established paradigm. Um, and the way we're meant to believe in it is just like religious belief, not. Uh, in line with the, the spirit of the enlightenment even. So, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. Um, 
this book is um this is great and um i think i'm i'm actually figured out how to record on zoom with hd mode on which it's about time i could have figured out before couldn't i so hopefully it's a better quality of video if you watch this on youtube so we'll see anyway um yeah all right then uh bye for now <laughs>